everybody. Everybody online, welcome to you as well. If you're joining us there and maybe you're here and it's your first time, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. I'm Father Sean McCain Titus, and uh, we're, we're, again, so happy that you're with us this morning. And especially on such a strange day. How many of you grew up uh, celebrating the Feast of the Ascension? Right? Look at this. Okay, there's like two. I didn't either. Um, most of us didn't. And in fact, uh, I didn't really have a lot of attention given to it until much later on in life, maybe even seminary. It's one of these really strange, uh, sort of underrated, doesn't get a lot of press feast days of the church year. But y'all, when I sort of stumbled into the, the Feast of the Ascension, the story behind this, it really changed everything in my view of who Jesus is and what it meant to follow him now. Especially while we don't have him in body. Y'all notice this? He's not here. I mean, physically looking at us, right? But he is here and we know this mysteriously with his presence. How do we make sense of this? This is what the Feast of the Ascension is tackling. This is what it's all about. So we got in the, the Gospel of Luke, who, by the way, um, the, the author of Luke, Luke, he wrote the Gospel of Luke, but he also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. And you'll notice in our Acts reading this morning, he said, in my first book that I wrote to you, Theophilus, right? He's talking about the Gospel of Luke. And um, this transition that happens between the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, the, the hinge, the sort of overlap, is the Ascension story. So you'll get this Ascension story in both of those accounts, which is really, really awesome, actually. So in, in Acts 1, uh, verse 3, it says this. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them, with many convincing proofs. I want, to, I want to hear those, right? Like, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So, considering Jesus risen, appearing to them, showing him their wounds, showing them his wounds, convincing them, arguing with them perhaps, being with them for 40 days and doing what Jesus always did, preached about the kingdom of God, Right? Considering this as a context, I think it's actually quite reasonable that the disciples would ask him, Lord, is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Uh, they had been witnesses, think about this, of all of his power that he's demonstrated in all these years they've been together. His power to heal, to forgive, to bless, his power over death itself to raise, rise from the dead. All power belongs to Jesus of Nazareth. And his disciples were eyewitnesses of this. They knew firsthand. So the disciples asked if he was going to use that power that he has proven to have. Is he going to use it to restore Israel's sovereignty now? It's pretty reasonable, right? Might he even be like King David? Or Joshua? Who would take the land in conquest? And bring about the kingdom of God on earth? But Jesus' answer sort of is, maintains this, um, it's sort of vague, it's sort of still out of touch, out of reach for the disciples. It, you don't need to know the, the hows, the times, the whens of this, his answer sort of implies. But it's also sort of revealing something the disciples still struggle to understand, I think, about who Jesus is. The Lord who has made himself present to his disciples, who are invited to touch him, to embrace him, to share a meal with him, to keep his company. This Jesus who is still present with them, inviting them to sit at his feet again and learn. This Jesus who is so intimately involved in their lives, they still struggle to see that fellowship with him is the presence of the kingdom. Do you see Lord, but when are you going to reestablish your kingdom? And Jesus, I imagine, sort of peering into their eyes. In my presence, you are in the kingdom. And yet there's more to come. The disciples had something else in mind, almost sort of looking past him like, yeah, but. Like, but where's the, where's the rest of the story? When are you going to reestablish the kingdom of Israel? The disciples want to return to some sort of former glory. And rightly so as a Jew, like you would be so well read of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, that you would understand God is going to establish his kingdom. Even as Christians, we say this, but what kind of kingdom? How? When? This is what the disciples were after. And I, I have to imagine, and again, I'm with the disciples on this one, that 
they were recalling some sort of former glory of the kingdom of Israel. They longed for that earthly governance of God's people. It echoes that ancient call from Israel to God, like, can you give us a a king like the other nations? You remember that? I feel that with them. I can hear that in this. But Jesus, again, is something quite different, isn't he? Like, again, a new Joshua, like a new David in a lot of ways, but totally unlike them, in fact. Very different. His conquests and his reign don't involve violence in the world, but a love that overcomes it. He didn't arrive with tanks on Palm Sunday, remember this? But on a donkey. He didn't take up retaliation. He endured suffering. He isn't threatened, but entrusts himself to the Father. Now, if his kingdom is anything like him, and it is, then it's going to resemble all of these things. This is what I think Jesus is longing to reveal to his disciples and even to us this morning. That Jesus of Nazareth wields a kind of power that the disciples have witnessed, but yet still don't quite understand. But they will. And this is his promise on this Ascension Sunday. In verse 8, Jesus promises them, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He's sending them. Jesus doesn't need them to know how and when uh, his kingdom will come. He doesn't need them to get in the kitchen or like sort of the war room of the logistics. Okay, guys, here's how the kingdom's going. He doesn't need their help with that. What does he need his help, their help with? To become the kinds of people that resemble and represent his kingdom by filling them with his own spirit. Do you see this, that the project that God has in our lives isn't to go and establish his kingdom, but to become a kind of person that resembles it? When we light incense, one of the prayers we pray is, Lord, would our lives be a sweet fragrance like this incense to you? Our lives, friends, should have that fragrance of God's kingdom. What a mystery. Doesn't that get you thinking about, oh boy, the things I'm doing and what I'm putting my energy into and the things I love and the things I chase down and what is my life about? Jesus is inspiring us and promising us, in fact, that when he gives us his spirit, our our lives would have that aroma of God's kingdom. It It would resemble Jesus himself. On the flip side, this is not the kind of power, in other words, uh, that requires, I'm sorry, the, the kind of power that Jesus is inviting us to take up is the kind of power that requires us to lay down other types of make it happen by our own power, sorts of power. That's the most confusing sentence I've preached all day. <laughs> Taking on this power means putting down a different kind of power. The, a power that I'm very familiar with of like, Lord, let, Lord, let me make this happen. Watch, hold on, hold my beer. I got this, Jesus. Kind of power, right? We have to relinquish our need to sort of make something happen. We have to resist this temptation to resort to means very unlike Jesus. Things that Jesus would never do, we're never required to do those things in order to accomplish his aims. Does that make sense? We're going to have to lay down some of the things we're used to doing, friends. This heavenly power is a totally different thing God's kingdom is established by God's son and with God's spirit making God's witnesses in us notice the agency in this this is all about what God is doing to us and the kinds of people we're becoming in response witnesses at this moment in the story the Lord goes out of view he's taken up with the clouds the disciples stand there looking uh, for Jesus where he isn't anymore. Where is he now? And this is this point of the story that I feel like finally the disciples get to see it from my angle. Like, yeah, welcome to the party. Where is Jesus now? How you like it, disciples? You can't see him in person. Yeah, I've been living my whole Christian life like this. Welcome. This is when the disciples' story and ours really begin to overlap. Now we start to share some space where we are left with faith. Waiting for God's provision wondering what just happened and what we're going to do next that's exactly where we are isn't it 
Where is Jesus? Now, like the disciples, we might be concerned by absence rather than looking forward to see presence, as Willie Jennings says. Now, where Jesus leads them and us is into this future, this unknown. And that is exactly where we will find him. If we want to know where he is, it's in the future that he's leading us into. He promises us, he promises that he will be there with us. We will find Jesus in our obedience to him. Wait here. Receive the Spirit. He's giving us some instructions. We will find him in our obedience to those instructions. Even as we enter into a really unknown path, an unknown journey, we don't know what's going to happen. Think of the disciples at this moment in the story. They don't know what's going to unfold. And if they did know, I don't know if they would have taken the next step. And yet, they're not required to know. They're required to obey. Wait here. You're going to need this gift that I have for you. Wait here. Receive my spirit. The disciples could have um, just sort of memorialized that point and not gone forward. They could have and might continue to sort of reach back in history and long for those times, grasping for some past and trying dragging that into the future again, sort of like their call for the kingdom of Israel to be brought and established once again. They could have done all of those things. But they obeyed and they waited for God's spirit in Jerusalem that would lead them into this newness. And I know this is really counterintuitive, friends. As counterintuitive as this might seem, Jesus' absence in body means his presence in spirit. And if we think that Jesus is brilliant, or just like not crazy, let's just say, and not a liar, let's just imagine that he knows what he's saying, and he believes it, and he thinks he's telling the truth then there's some genius, there's some brilliance that we should trust when he says, it's better for you that I go away. We may not understand that. We might think, no, you should be here, Jesus. But he's saying, no, in body, it's better that I am with the Father, interceding on your behalf and sending my spirit upon you. It is better for you. So his absence in body means presence in spirit, and we can trust that. It also means that our human presence, our humanity is now eternally present with God the Father. Think of this. Our humanity is present in the Holy Trinity, in the heavenly realm. There's a human being in the Godhead. Come on, what is this about? So he is with us, and yet we are also with him. There is this mysterious communion, even now in the Trinity. And friends, as Jesus ascends, perhaps he speaks to us, to you and I, stay in Austin. Stay in your place, wherever you find yourself, stay at home. Don't go doing, don't get busy for Jesus. Stay and wait. Indefinitely? No. Wait for the Spirit of God that he's going to send to you. I wonder if this isn't exactly what we're doing as a community, not just personally, but as a community of people, of disciples gathered in this place and time, obeying Jesus, learning to depend on the provision of his spirit for a very unknown future. Who knows what will happen next? I personally need to hear this. I was talking with folks earlier, like sermons are just sort of Sean's way of working some stuff out in his own life sometimes, almost every time. Every time, I should just be honest. It's every single time. I personally need to hear this. I don't know how my life will go. I know that I'm a priest. I know I'm a dad. I know I'm a husband and a friend, a neighbor. But I don't know how it is that God will establish his kingdom in my life and in the lives of people around me. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to go for me leading this parish. I have no idea. I mean, I hope it goes well, right? But I don't know. I'm not in control of these things. But I don't need to know any of these things. All I need to know is that Jesus sends his spirit to transform me into one of his witnesses. And I I can receive that and cooperate with it and say, yes, Lord, do your best. I need a lot of work. Do your best. That's what I do know. And I do know that he promises to do the exact same thing for you. He knows you. You don't have to be clergy. To be transformed into a witness, 
Not at all. It has nothing to do with that, actually. He knows your name, friends. He knows the place that you're in. He knows the burdens and the questions that you carry around every single day and even now. And he doesn't require of you a strategy to sort all of this out. He doesn't require of you to know exactly how it's going to unfold. What he calls us to is to wait on him. To receive his spirit. And all the power that comes with this. And then to take the next step of obedience. In the same way that his spirit would compel you to. Amen, Sean? Amen. Friends, we are free to leave the logistics of things, of the kingdom, and even some of our parts of our lives to the one who rules, rules over all of it. We don't need to police or defend most things, to be honest, as much as we think we should police and defend. We certainly don't need to police or defend the church or the kingdom of God. I think Jesus has got that one, right? It is not under threat, nor are our lives, even though we may not be totally safe and we may run into harm, our lives and our lives' futures, they're not under threat, but they're safe and secure in the life of God. And we can entrust ourselves to the Father who governs and sees over all of these things with the Son right beside him, now that he has ascended. Following Jesus is difficult, not because his aims are unknown to us, We know the good news of God's kingdom. We know God is reconciling all things to himself through Jesus. We know this, right? It's not a mystery. Following Jesus is difficult because it requires our trust, our faith, our laying down of the sort of embattled wars that we take up and the means that we take up. I'll make this happen, the sort of force that we employ, the things that we think will help that project along. Our laying down of our shame of sin, perhaps. Our laying down of anything that tempts us to use power, our power, rather than the heavenly power that resembles Christ and the God who gives it to us. Everything else has got to go. Take up the power that the Spirit gives us and use it exactly in the way that Jesus would, in the way that resembles him. So this morning, friends, I want to ask you, do you find yourself needing to heed Christ's invitation this morning to stay here? Stay put. Settle down. Calm down for a second. Just like hold your horses. Wait. Listen to me. Do you find yourself needing to do a little bit of that? In this place of presence and promise, wait here. I will be with you. And I will send you the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you been needing wisdom about what to do next? It may be a problem or a question in your life. Do you struggle with Trusting that God knows what he's doing with your life? What does your soul need this morning? That's what I'm asking. What does your soul need this morning? Friends, let's then wait to be filled with his spirit. To hear God speak those words of comfort and wisdom and power into our lives. That's what we need. And it's only in him that we can get it. Let's be ready to be sent. Not to just stay put or memorialize this moment to be, but to be sent into the world with the ascended one who is with us always and will never leave us from this day and forevermore. Amen.